Dear YouTube, in case you are investigating this video due to a complaint about hate speech or copyright violation, allow me to give the following assurances. Firstly, a word on copyright. If the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania is unhappy because I've used their propaganda in a way they disapprove of, please know that I am very familiar with copyright law and have ensured that any use of copyrighted material in this video falls within the fair use provisions, particularly as pertain to criticism and parody. Secondly, let me ease any concerns you may have about hate speech. Though I am unapologetically a critic of the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, I feel no hatred whatsoever when it comes to individual believers. I have even spoken out on occasion against the harassment and mistreatment of witnesses. Rather than being hateful, this video and indeed my channel represents my attempt at respectfully offering a helpful resource for witnesses who are beginning to think of their faith as false or harmful and would like to know the other side of the argument. viewers and welcome to my rebuttal of the May 2018 episode of JW Broadcasting. This episode is hosted by none other than Governing Body member Mark Sanderson. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Our focus is on our ministry in this May 2018 edition of JW Broadcasting. To set the stage for the experiences in our program, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes on the theme, Invigorate Your Ministry, How? You, dear brothers and sisters, are having a regular share in the preaching work, and just think of the results. Each year, about two billion hours are spent in the ministry. Millions of Bible studies are conducted, and those being baptized number into the hundreds of thousands. If you are a kingdom publisher, you have had a share in those thrilling statistics. So right off the bat, we are given some thrilling statistics that Jehovah's Witnesses are to be proud of. Um, and one thing that, I mean, obviously, when you're going to say we've had billions of Bible studies, there have been billions of hours, there's been hundreds of thousands of baptisms, that sounds impressive. But then you have to remember, first of all, that we're talking about a religion that is already in the millions. So it's hardly going to be a few hundred hours or a few hundred baptisms. The figure's going to be big. And the other thing that's worth mentioning is that when these statistics are cited, they are always cited in isolation, as in um, let's give you the numbers for a year rather than giving you the picture over a number of years. And I just thought I'd, out of interest, bring myself up to speed on what's been happening with these figures over the past five years. And I will show you roughly what the figures are based on what Watchtower reports in its in its year in its yearbooks. These are the last few um, years worth of yearbooks. Don't know whether you can see there. Let's look at the last five years worth of figures. And what you see is that in 2013 and 2014, you had a growth, an annual growth figure of around 2.1, 2.2%, which isn't that impressive when you consider, you know, that by this point, um, the cart witnessing was up and running, JW.org was up and running. Then in sort of 2014, 2015, we start getting the JW broadcasting episode. So basically Watchtower is piling in all these resources and new methods of doing things. And what we end up with <laughs> is in 2016, 2017, the growth figure is down to 1.8 and as of last year, 1.4. And it's worth mentioning at this point that anything south of 1.1%, which last time I checked was 
the birth death ratio. So in other words, <laughs> The organization needs to be growing growing by 1.1% purely by virtue of new witnesses being born or children being born to witness parents and witnesses dying and the, the, the ratio that you get from that. So <laughs> the ratio needs to be at least 1.1%. It's 1.4% as of last year. So despite all of these resources... All of these new techniques, um, new website, new um, video propaganda channel, new car witnessing, which came in in 2012, things are sliding backwards. And what's even more interesting is that Mark Sanderson cites the, in his thrilling statistics, <laughs> Mark Sanderson cites the fact that um, there are hundreds of thousands of baptisms. Well, it's true that there has been a slight... Well, the, the baptisms are more or less where they began. So in 2013, there were 277,000 baptisms, and then it dipped slightly, and now it's up, as of last year, to 284,000 baptisms. But what's interesting is that we are now on, as he mentions, 2 billion hours of preaching every year and if you look at if you do the math um that means that the hours per baptism so the number of hours it takes to produce one baptized jehovah's witness bearing in mind that anecdotally the the majority of newly baptized witnesses are children of Jehovah's Witnesses, which is nothing to be proud of. I mean, we're talking here about preaching. We're talking here about going into the community and trying to attract new converts. But everyone, anyone who spent any time as a Jehovah's Witness knows that when you go to an assembly and you see new witnesses getting baptized, it's usually children <laughs> of, of witness families who are getting baptized. Rarely do you encounter someone nowadays who becomes a witness due to the preaching work. Um, so you need to kind of factor that in. But you look at the hours per baptism and the hours per baptism has been going up every year apart from last year. So it started at 6,600 hours in 2013. Um, it peaked at... 7,499 hours per baptism in 2016 and last year it dipped slightly to 7,199 hours per baptism which is <laughs> if you were to I mean it's a lot it's a big figure that but 7,199 hours is 300 days or 10 months Imagine doing nothing but preaching to someone. Imagine being in a room with someone for 10 months and just doing nothing but preaching to them and conducting Bible studies with them. And after that 10 months of nothing but 24-hour preaching, they get baptised. That's how much time is needed to produce a new Jehovah's Witness. And that apparently, those apparently are thrilling statistics that Jehovah's Witnesses need to be proud of. But there's a potential danger. With so much to do in our life, not just in the ministry, but also with secular work, family responsibilities, for some even health issues, we can get into a rut. It's not always easy to detect at first, because in this age of technology, we always feel busy. But what consumes our day? Watch this one-minute video and try to detect what's going on in the life of one brother. His life is in a rut. Try to figure out why. Spoiler alert, it turns out the young brother's life is in a rut because he isn't sufficiently busying himself serving Watchtower. Oh, 
Would you say that this brother's life is in a rut? Oh, he's active all day. He always has something to do. But it's as if his mind has been kidnapped by his devices. How dreadful. His mind has been kidnapped by his devices. And as we all know, it would be much better if his mind could instead be kidnapped by Mark Sanderson and his colleagues. Seriously, though, we are right at the beginning of this JW Broadcasting episode. And right out of the gate, we have propaganda like this that is aimed at manipulating Jehovah's Witnesses into believing that unless they are occupying themselves with doing activities that Watchtower approves of, reading their Bibles, preparing for meetings, going on the ministry, giving talks, unless they're doing those things, they are in a rut. Their lives are meaningless. Have you ever had the experience of reading an email while someone is trying to tell you something? It can be embarrassing when you realize that they've asked you a question and they're waiting for an answer, but you have no idea what they asked. It's embarrassing, right? But what if the person who is trying to speak to you is Jehovah? Even though we aren't doing anything wrong, our daily routine can occupy our attention so much that we are not able to hear the refreshing words of Jehovah. When you think about what Mark has just said there, it's really quite amazing. What he's saying is that if you are busy reading emails, if you're busy, in other words, if you're busy with things other than serving Watchtower, you're ignoring Jehovah. So if you're not going to, if you're not thinking about preparing for the meeting or doing your Bible reading, if you're not, if your mind isn't engaged with reading what Watchtower wants you to read or viewing what Watchtower wants you to view, you're ignoring Jehovah. In other words, Watchtower equals Jehovah. And this is one of the most tedious elements of Watchtower propaganda that we see repeatedly this blurring of the lines between Watchtower and Jehovah so that the two are almost the same. One Christian sister described it this way, I would go out in service, go to meetings, study, pray, but I did it all on automatic control, never feeling anything. Have you ever felt that way? Do you see all the happy servants of Jehovah whose experiences appear on JW Broadcasting? And you say to yourself, why can't I find that joy? Why is my ministry in a rut? Perhaps you feel like a remote control train that goes around and around on a track, working the same territory with the same partner, saying the same thing at each door. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being in a good routine. But being in a rut can sap our energy and take the joy out of our service. I don't want to make a huge deal about it, but this for me is a little bit patronizing. Mark, I know what you mean when you say a remote control train or a toy train going round a track. You don't need to show me a video of it. But this whole thing about being stuck in a rut and it feeling as though you're on automatic pilot and just doing the same thing week after week. That is an experience that I'm sure the majority of witnesses have or, or, or can at least relate to. It was certainly my experience when I was a Jehovah's Witness that you, you, you just feel as though you're on this never ending hamster wheel. In fact, I prefer hamster wheel because it better illustrates the idea of expending energy to get nowhere um, and you're just repeating the same process again and again and again but it's what Watchtower needs in order for you to stay indoctrinated if you are busy doing things 
that benefit watchtower, you don't have as much time to think for yourself. So it's in watchtower's interests for you to be on that train track, just going round and round and round. Because the minute you're not going round and round and round, the minute you have the freedom to think for yourself and think, well, hang on, does this make sense? What do I really believe? You know, if I just kind of distance myself a little bit and take a step back and view the broader perspective, what's really happening here? Am I really serving God's organisation and contributing to this wonderful worldwide increase before Armageddon? Or am I just another drone in the system that's being made to go through the motions, being made to be engaged in this kind of token activity just to keep me busy and just to show that I am subservient? Because the truth is, witnesses, as I already showed with the um, figures, witnesses are doing more and more and more hours every year, apart from last year, but the, the number of hours per baptism is going up and up and up. And what do they have to show for it? 1.4% growth last year. It's not achieving anything. And the reason it's not achieving anything is because it doesn't make any sense. And because when witnesses preach to someone, that person, because they're not indoctrinated yet, um, that person then has the freedom to go home, jump on Google or jump on YouTube, and they can honestly be thinking, wow, this thing that uh, Lloyd told me about um, there being a, a wonderful new world that's where there is only peace and the Bible foretells this, that sounds really appealing. I wonder what Google has to say. I wonder what YouTube videos there are on this. And the minute they do any digging, any digging, they're going to think, oh, I can't believe I was stupid enough to momentarily fall for it. We could even come to view our ministry as boring. Of course, we feel invigorated when we get good results. We meet an interested person going from door to door. We're invigorated. An inactive person approaches the cart and wants to get in touch with the local congregation. We're even more invigorated. We start a Bible study. We're on top of the world. I'm sure you'll agree. All those outcomes are good reasons for joy. The problem is that we're not always in control of getting those outcomes. In real life, we may spend an entire morning in the door-to-door -door work without meeting an interested person. We may spend months making return visits without starting a study. And once again, our ministry can get into a rut. Now, don't misunderstand. It's not that we're doing anything wrong, but we're not getting the full joy out of doing what's right. Of course, Satan would love it if our service to Jehovah were to fall into a rut. He would love it if we lost our joy. If we lose our joy, we lose hope, we lose strength, and we might even begin to feel like giving up. And the last thing we want is for Jehovah's Witnesses to figure out they're in a cult and give up. That would be catastrophic. Honestly, um, this is just, we're going from the sublime to the ridiculous now. Because although he stresses that it's not the witness's fault if they feel they're in a rut, he then says, but if you do get into a rut and you lose your joy, this is exactly what Satan wants. And we can't give him that satisfaction. So what you really need to do is develop joy in your ministry. Witnesses are here being ordered to be joyful. Just think about that for one moment and think about how Orwellian that is. The point is this, brothers and sisters. If you feel that your ministry has fallen into a rut, don't be discouraged and don't give up. There are ways that we can invigorate our ministry and serve Jehovah with renewed joy. And these ways are essentially twofold. First of all, serve Watchtower more. I kid you not. As we go on in this video, 
one of the main ways of getting out of a rut in your ministry if you're a Jehovah's Witness is to learn a foreign language, participate in a foreign language group, do pioneering, um, uh, apply for a school such as the School for Kingdom Evangelizers, basically do more for Watchtower. The second way that we learn in this broadcast to get out to get out of a rut is essentially just to shake things up a bit, to do things slightly differently, to stop working with the same person again and again and again in the preaching work and work with different one, different ones. In other words, just change something. Maybe it will maybe it will liven things up a little bit. I kid you not, that is essentially the advice that we are being given in this broadcast. To illustrate that, maybe you've had the frustrating experience of locking yourself out of your house or apartment. Of course, with a key, opening the door is simple. A locked door might seem like an obstacle, but it isn't if you have the key. And the same is true with invigorating our ministry. If we've fallen into a rut, if we've lost that feeling of joy in our service, there are a number of keys that can help us unlock the door. So yes, apparently we needed that brief clip of a brother and sister encountering a locked door and producing a key and putting the key in the door and turning it and then walking through the door. We needed that to know what Mark was talking about, to understand it. And what Mark now proceeds to do is give a number of Bible examples, which I won't play all of them. If you want to see the whole thing, you can obviously go on the JW Broadcasting website, tv.jw.org, and watch the whole thing. I've spared you some of the most tedious parts, but he proceeds to read from verses in the Bible which talk about um, people like Paul accepting new challenges and they find a key and it, the key might just be an opportunity to do something a little differently and they do things differently rather than doing what they were supposed to do they accept an opportunity that's given to them again all this amounts to if you are bored if you are in a rut if you feel like you're just going over the same ground again and again it's down to you to do more for Watchtower or to just change things slightly because who knows, maybe just a reboot is all you need. A reboot is definitely what Jehovah's Witnesses need, but rather than just rebooting the way they serve the cult, I would recommend rebooting the cult altogether by getting out of it. Sometimes the key to getting out of a rut in our ministry is to take advantage of opportunities we have right where we are. For example, have you considered auxiliary pioneering or regular pioneering? What about learning a foreign language with the goal of helping a nearby group or congregation? So there you go. That's what I was just telling you, <laughs> that the two recommended ways of getting out of a rut are to serve Watchtower more and to shake things up a bit. And here you have Mark Sanderson telling witnesses, well, have you considered pioneering? or auxiliary pioneering, or joining a foreign language group. Uh, if you serve us more, if you busy yourself even more, then things will fix themselves. You will magically find the joy that we're ordering you to have. Opening one door often leads to other doors of opportunity. For example, a brother named Jacob wrote this. When I was seven, Many of my classmates were Vietnamese. I wanted to tell them about Jehovah, so after a while, I made plans to learn their language. For the most part, I learned by comparing the English and Vietnamese editions of the Watchtower. I also made friends in a nearby Vietnamese language congregation. When I was 18, I started pioneering. Later, I attended the Bible School for Single Brothers. This helped me with my present pioneer assignment where I am the only elder in a Vietnamese language group. Many Vietnamese people are amazed that I have learned their language. They invite me in, and often I can study the Bible with them. Some have progressed to baptism. The point is, 
our ministry is what we make it. If we allow ourselves to remain in a rut, it will be boring. If we use our keys, if we take advantage of opportunities that present themselves, we will invigorate our ministry and give it new meaning. I love the fact that he starts off by saying he was seven years old and he learned Vietnamese to preach to his classmates. And right away, there you have a red flag because children should go to school to learn. They shouldn't be going to school to um, recruit people into their cult. There is nothing to be proud of here. This is purely exploitative. This is literally a cult telling children to, instead of learning, instead of just thinking about learning when they go to school, to use their education to benefit Watchtower. Absolutely shameful. And again, the way Mark uses this experience is to say, well, if you're not doing what this brother did, if you're not shaking things up a bit, if you're not uh, doing more for Watchtower, then it's on you if you feel bored. In fact, there's a saying, don't work harder, work smarter. The key to working smarter could be as simple as switching things up a bit. For example, could we work with different publishers instead of the same one all the time? Could we try a different approach to our presentation, perhaps making better use of the Bible or our videos? Could we engage in other aspects of the ministry, such as cart witnessing or phone witnessing? Could we use our time more effectively to reach people when they're most likely to be home? So again, I warned you of this. There are essentially two solutions to being in a rut. Either do more for Watchtower, which we've heard, a pioneer, auxiliary pioneer, learn a new language, or switch things up a bit. In other words, just do something different. Change your presentation work with someone else, maybe that will get you out of it. I don't, I don't see how that could work. I can see how it could trick the witness into thinking that, oh, I'm doing something different. Everything's different now. How wonderful this is. I'm now working with different people. I'm now trying a new presentation. I'm now showing videos in my preaching work, which by the way is just plain creepy. I mean, I really would struggle if I were a witness, if I was told that I need to literally thrust a video in someone's face. Um, it would be rather presumptuous, I think, to, to not just recommend a video to someone, but to literally stand there, stand there and make them watch the damn thing. But this is Watchtower's solution, and this is supposed to inject the joy that is missing. When again, the elephant in the room here is that Watchtower is a cult, the teachings don't make sense, the followers are just supposed to be doing these rituals, these observances, um, these actions that are just supposed to keep them occupied. Sometimes, we think that only those who are young can reach out to pioneer or to serve where the need is greater. But that's not always the case. You parents may be able to unlock a door of opportunity for yourselves and think of the example you set for your children when you do so. That's what a mother named Tara discovered. I started pioneering when my youngest daughter was in elementary school, she says. It was important to me that my children see me serving Jehovah to the best of my ability as I encouraged them to reach out. Tara's husband, Anthony, saw the effect that his wife's pioneering had, and in time, he too joined the ranks. This is what he said. When Tara became a pioneer, it made an immediate impact on daughters number one and number two, and they became pioneers. When I became a pioneer, daughters number three and number four followed. I wish I had pursued full-time service sooner, as it made a huge impact on the spirituality of the family. What we're hearing is a classic example of child indoctrination. The parents do something, the children follow along. 
how is there anything to be proud of here? It's not like only in Jehovah's Witnesses does this method work. It works in all religions. So how this kind of experience can be repeatedly appealed to as though it makes Jehovah's Witnesses special or unique is just beyond me. Whenever I see this picture, it reminds me of the intrepid spirit that my mother had, not being afraid to take on a challenging assignment, but putting complete trust in Jehovah. That spirit encourages me even to this day. My father has that same spirit. In the summer of 1976, when I was 11 years old, a new arrangement was announced at our district convention, auxiliary pioneering. You could be an auxiliary pioneer if you could devote 60 hours in one month to the ministry. The month of October 1976 had five weekends. My father encouraged our whole congregation to try auxiliary pioneering that month. So many brothers and sisters, including me, decided to get a taste of pioneering. It was a wonderful experience that I will never forget. Parents, your good example will help your children to have a living ministry of their own that they will love. Not for the first time, Mark Sanderson, who isn't a parent, who doesn't have kids, is handing out parenting advice. And I've heard him do this before in other talks where he's encouraged parents to get their children baptised as young as possible. Um, it would be distasteful enough coming from a governing body member like Tony Morris. And as far as, I, as far as I'm aware, Tony Morris is the only governing body member with children. It would be distasteful enough coming from someone like Tony Morris, um, telling parents to manipulate their children into serving Watchtower. But it, for me, it's just even more distasteful coming from someone who doesn't know what it's like to have children. And quite frankly, I've heard so many stories from people emailing into JW Survey or contacting me in some way from people who have said that it was having children that contributed to them waking up. Because they, they looking at their children, they couldn't bring themselves to thrust beliefs that they themselves were uncertain of on young minds and just repeat the process all over again. The process that they had been through themselves, having been indoctrinated as children. Having children themselves forced them to reevaluate whether this was really something that they wanted to, um, where they wanted to repeat history and, and indoctrinate their children. And it helped to wake them up. But Mark Sanderson is here doing the opposite. He's saying, well, never mind, you know, whether you are certain of your beliefs. Never mind whether you are bored with your life as a witness. Just whatever you do, make sure that the next generation follows your footsteps because we need, we need continuing generations of subservient followers. The school really is a gift from Jehovah. I've encouraged others I know to attend the school because you really feel how Jehovah cares for his organisation. And a small thing we can do is simply give our best. And the school helps us to do just that, find out what is our best. I do miss my house. It's nice to have your own house and not to have to worry about paying rent. I miss my hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing compares to the blessings and the joy that comes from serving where there's a need. This joy helps us to combat any homesickness we feel and stops us from developing any desire to go back home. In the big city, everything's very rushed. I would only see my wife when I got home from work. I'd be tired and then also have to care for congregational matters, so there wasn't much time for us to be together. Now it's completely different. We have much more time during the ministry, in the congregation, being together at home. So for us as a family, it's been very positive, very good. We're not tired, we're not old in the sense no, of saying that not. we've got no more to give. We really believe we can do more for Jehovah. And we want to do more for Jehovah. The school is proof that he wants us to do more. 
We want to use our life to the full to serve Jehovah wherever he sends us. We're willing to go. We feel it's the only way to say a big thank you to Jehovah for everything he's done for us. The territory, school, the brothers and Bible students. What better way to thank Jehovah? Do you feel the way that brother and sister Sosa felt? That you've missed the chance to do more for Jehovah? They learned there were doors of opportunity accessible to them if they were willing to reach out. So this segment with brother and sister Sosa is the first of a number of testimonies scattered throughout this episode showing mostly couples who have decided to reach out, meaning to do more for Watchtower. And in this instance, it's a couple in Brazil who decide that they want to go to the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. And to help make this happen, they sell their home, they move out of the city, they make these huge sacrifices to go and serve where the need is greater and to attend this school. And it was, well, there were two things that stood out for me there. One was the fact that Sister Souza gets quite emotional during the interview and uh, interestingly the interpreter is almost trying to elsewhere in the video is almost trying to mimic the emotional side of things in the way she's interpreting into English but there's this emotional element that you get repeatedly in JW broadcasting testimonies where again logic is bypassed and I'm sure this will work on Jehovah's Witnesses watching this. They will see the emotion and that alone will be will make the whole thing compelling. And it's also interesting that Sister Sosa talks about giving the I forget the exact way she puts it, but she talks about giving your life for Jehovah. And what more do you need to say? <laughs> That's what witnesses are being asked to do is give their lives to Watchtower. When we're faced with challenging assignments, reliance on Jehovah is of utmost importance. In what ways can we show that reliance? I have the pleasure of introducing you to a friend of mine, Shane Brady, who is presently serving along with his wife, Yolanda, at the branch in Finland. Brother Shane Brady and I previously worked together at the Canada branch. Shane has been involved in legally defending our brothers for the past 22 years in many countries, including Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. Shane, it's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's, it's great to see you too, Mark. Shane, we want to ask you, what have been some of the challenges that you've faced in accepting these assignments in various countries in the world? Well, there have certainly been a few uh, challenges. One is uh, frequent travel. Another is language. Each country that we assist has its own language. Some court cases are very stressful. And at times we've faced firsthand the, uh, the hatred of our opposers. Yes. And you know, Shane, in spite of all that, you, you and your wife have always been willing to go on these assignments. We, we appreciate your spirit so much. I is there an experience that you can share with us that would give us a taste of the kind of situations that you've had to deal with in these countries? Well, there, there have been many experiences. Uh, one experience that comes to mind a few months ago, there was a special pioneer, a case was started against him. And if the decision was negative, it, it could be have very serious consequences for our work in that country. So we did our best to present a strong defense. But as the trial progressed, things didn't seem to be going so well. But on the last day of the, uh, the trial, everything changed. We presented a motion and we asked the judge to terminate the case against the brother. Now, personally, I, di I didn't think it would actually work, but one older brother that we worked with over the years, he always told us, we need to give Jehovah something to bless. And so we did. And uh, the results were quite unexpected. When we made the motion, the judge turned to the prosecutor and asked, well, what's your opinion? And to our surprise, the prosecutor agreed with our request and he even went beyond what we asked. 
He said to the judge that the government official that started the case against our brother should be punished. Well, the judge agreed. The case was terminated. When we were walking out of the courtroom, I looked at the other brothers with me, and we, we all said the same thing, like, what happened? Well, it was obvious. Jehovah had intervened. That's wonderful, Shane. Yes, Jehovah intervened, because as we know, Jehovah is an interventionist God, or to be more exact, he is a selectively interventionist God, meaning that he intervenes to benefit Watchtower and only to benefit Watchtower, whether it's to arrange for building materials to be made available, as we heard in that crazy experience about a, a Kingdom Hall refurb on the island of Yap, where it was suggested that a typhoon had delivered sand and that this was Jehovah's hand, apparently. So he does things like that. He arranges for the weather to be favourable, for copies of the New World Translation to be printed, which was something that Jeffrey Jackson said on the platform at the annual meeting when the New World, the 2013 New World Translation edition was released. And here we see Jehovah intervening in a court case um, in some country where a special pioneer was being prosecuted. Interesting that Jehovah can only intervene in certain court cases and not in others, such as the one in the United Kingdom, A versus Watchtower, where Watchtower ended up being fined for their negligence when it comes to child abuse mishandling. So... It's, again, very, very selective. Jehovah only intervenes to help Watchtower, and even then, he, for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, he can't quite intervene in every, on every occasion. But what strikes me about this particular part of the episode is interviewing this guy, and what becomes apparent in each of the stories that this guy tells is that there is this phenomenon at play where if something good happens that's favourable to Watchtower, that's evidence of Jehovah's hand. And if there is some kind of persecution, if there is some, if things don't go well for Watchtower, well, this is evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted in the time of the end. And I made a song about this. Uh, I intended to make a series of songs and I never kind of quite got around to it. But the first of these of this series was called Good Things, Bad Things. I saw it in the yearbook, we've grown by 2%. This proved Jehovah's Witnesses are truly heaven sent. And if the numbers start to fall, there is no need to scoff. The love of the greater number is expected to cool off. You see, when good things happen, it's true. And when bad things happen, it's true. And when good and bad things happen at the same time, that's your clearest proof that it's Jehovah God's clean organization. Requiring your obedient dedication. I'm not going to inflict the whole song on you because I don't have the best singing voice, but... The point of my song was to highlight this exact phenomenon where if something favourable happens to Watchtower, well, that's evidence of Jehovah backing the organisation. If something bad happens to Watchtower, well, that's evidence that this is God's one true organisation because this was predicted to happen. And that is exactly what we're seeing in these experiences. In, in another land where our work is not recognised, on the night of the memorial, a number of the brothers were arrested for so-called illegal religious activity. They were all convicted at trial. So we arrangements were made to appeal each of those cases, and they were heard before a different appeal court judge. What at first seemed quite negative, uh, the loss at trial, turned out to be a, an amazing result. Now, let me give you just one example. In one of the appeals, as we were presenting the appeal, not, not long into the case, the, the appeal court judge stopped us, and he began to ask us many questions about, about the Bible, about what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. So for quite some time, we answered these biblical questions, and then the case continued. And then after some minutes, the judge stopped us again. And this time the judge said, I remember reading in the Bible, the judge said this, I remember reading in the Bible that Jesus said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So we said to the judge, yes, indeed, 
that Jesus said that. The judge asked, do you think that's the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses are having problems in this region? Well, what could we say but agree with the judge? But that wasn't the end of it. As the case continued, a few minutes more, the judge stopped us again. And this time the judge said, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if Jesus said this. It's in the Bible where he said, um, where there are two or three gathered together, there I am in your midst. And we assured the judge, indeed, those are Jesus' words. And the judge looked out at this old courtroom, which was filled with our brothers and sisters, and he said, well, Jesus must be in our midst today. We, we felt like breaking into applause. At the end of the, uh, the court hearing, the judge ruled in our favor, acquitted the brother, and the judges in all of the other cases were also acquitted our brothers. It, it was just a thrilling experience. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, Shane. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. You see, for me, this experience proves that Watchtower's narrative of Satan's system being hell-bent on annihilating Jehovah's Witnesses and silencing them and arranging for them to be persecuted, that narrative makes no sense when you think about that story. Because if Satan truly is in control of this system of things, if he's pulling the strings here, if he has worldly governments and legal systems wrapped around his fingers, then this story shouldn't have happened. And indeed, if the worst had come to the worst, if the brothers had been sent to jail or whatever, had been punished in some way, you can bet that Watchtower would have been saying, well, there you go. That just proves that this is Satan's system of things and that the scripture which you heard quoted there about um, Jesus' disciples being persecuted, well, this proves that we're Jesus' disciples because we're being persecuted here. This judge has ruled against us. But the fact that the judge doesn't rule against them, and in fact seems to be, because of his own religious background presumably, seems to be swayed towards helping the witnesses, oh, well, this is evidence that Jehovah has intervened on our behalf and this proves that Jehovah is more powerful than Satan's rulerships and he has come to the rescue here and therefore we are God's one true organization again good things bad things if good things happen yay that's evidence if bad things happen yay that's evidence in other words if anything happens we can find a way of making this evidence and we've experienced firsthand the, the love of the, the amazing worldwide brotherhood. Could I just share one experience about that? But please, please do. Uh, two years ago, we were involved in a case where police had raided a congregation meeting in one country. They had brutally beaten the brothers, threatened the sisters. It was just terrible. Uh, some weeks later, in the court case that continued or started against the brothers, the police brought against the brothers, during that court case, the police repeatedly tried to arrest me and another brother I was working with. O over two days, they were trying to arrest us. Even in the courthouse, they tried to detain and arrest us. And all this, all through this, my wife Yolanda was watching what was happening. But you know what was so remarkable was despite the brutal treatment our brothers and sisters had endured just a few weeks earlier at the hands of these very same police officers, those dear brothers and sisters came to our aid. They were like a wall of protection around us, and they would not leave our side until the ordeal was done. It was love and action. So to answer your question, we have benefited in so many ways. We don't regret for a moment accepting this thrilling assignment. He's calling it a case of love in action. I would say that's conditional love in action, because those brothers and sisters would not have been interested in protecting him if it wasn't for the fact that he was a Jehovah's Witness, a Watchtower representative, no less. But if he didn't share their beliefs, then I very much doubt that they would have put themselves on the line to protect him. That's conditional love. And there's nothing surprising or unique about that phenomenon inside cults, where people band together and look out for each other because they have this siege mentality where the world is out to get them. And don't get me wrong, one thing that I do find lamentable in all of these stories is that there are countries, and it sounds like these are 
countries like Kazakhstan and far-flung countries that probably don't have a sophisticated uh, democracy in place. But there are countries out there that seem to have very backward approaches when it comes to how they deal with cults. And in many instances, this plays right into the hands of Watchtower because, again, they can point to the oppression, which in many cases, I'm sure, will be a complete overreaction. But they can point to this as evidence of, ah, well, there you see, we're being persecuted in fulfilment of Jesus' prophecy. So this proves that we're God's one true organisation. I think that is very lamentable. It strengthens Watchtower's hand. It gives them persecution stories that they can trot out for decades to come, as I've already mentioned in the case of Russia. But one thing that you can't do is um, use both sides of the argument. In other words, when things w go favourably for you, say, oh, well, this is Jehovah. And when things don't go fav favourably for you, say, oh, well, this also proves that we're God's one true organisation. Again, it's a very disingenuous form of reasoning. It makes no rational sense, but it's the sort of thing that you repeatedly see in Watchtower propaganda. We have been serving for some years in a Romanian language congregation, and we preach to people who have moved to Italy to seek a better life. When we heard the announcement about the special campaign, we looked at each other and said, Let's, Let's go. go! A large door of activity was opening up to us. But there was a problem, my job. I would need a month's leave of absence, and that would be difficult. We prayed, we did research, and during family worship, we decided that in order to participate, I would ask for a one-month leave from work. But Jehovah had something else in mind that would create the right circumstances for us. When I arrived at work the next day, I found an unexpected situation. Because of the failing economy, my boss gave me and some other employees a letter of dismissal. I was not at all worried. I trusted in Jehovah, and I knew that this new situation would allow me to participate in the campaign. So I kid you not, apparently we should all celebrate the fact that this guy lost his job because it, at least it enabled him to get on a plane and go preaching in Romania for a month, which is what he wanted to begin with. I mean, again, if you are new to these videos or if you're watching this as someone who's just interested in learning more about Jehovah's Witnesses, this is the organization. The organization is quite fine for people to lose their jobs if it means that they are benefited in some way, i.e people being able to go and preach in other countries where there is a need. In the real world, jobs are not expendable. Jobs are things that you should hold on to, especially if you happen to live in a country where there is a failing economy or the economy is under significant pressure. You should absolutely try and hold on to your job and not view it as something that you can just discard in favour of better serving your cult. Participating in this campaign is a dream come true. We wanted to participate in 2013, but unfortunately things in life do not always go as we would like. We received some truly shocking news. My father had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Emotionally, it was not easy. The tranquility we had dreamed and hoped for was almost gone. The only thing that could help me at that moment was the hope for what Jehovah promises us. In addition to my father's death, I began to experience panic attacks. I was afraid of something that didn't exist. Afraid of not being able to move on the kind of emotion that leaves a lump in your throat and you can't even breathe. I realized that only Jehovah could help me fill the void that I felt. After a family worship, Fabio and I decided to turn in our regular pioneer applications. 
I felt Jehovah at my side, embracing and supporting me. In the end, they turned out to be the three most beautiful years of our lives, which also allowed us to participate in this beautiful campaign. So what we've just seen, in my opinion, is probably the most disturbing part of the broadcast. First of all, because of the overtly emotional manipulation. This couple are taken out to a field when it's raining and asked to sit, uh, we call it the boots in the UK, I don't know what you'd call it in, in America, but they're made to sit at the back of the car um, with the boot lid open while it's raining because that's that adds a bit more emotion to things doesn't it and we want to emotionally we want to appeal to people's emotions at this point because we're making a propaganda film so let's go out to a field somewhere when it's raining and film there just for added drama so that's the first thing to notice and and also the fact that we're talking about a death here and this whether someone dies or not i mean People die all the time. You cannot get to the age of, say, 20 or 30 without losing someone who's close to you. But when people die, you just have to move on. You have to. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or a Scientologist or a Mormon or an atheist or a Pentecostal. It doesn't matter. You just have to move on. And you don't get to point to the fact that you've moved on and say, well, that's evidence that atheism works, or that's evidence that being a Jehovah's Witness works, or that's evidence that being a Mormon works, because they're all moving on, no matter what religion you're in. But this brings me to the most disturbing part of this, which is the way that death and grieving is hijacked by the Jehovah's Witness religion in particular. And I'm sure this happens in other religions too, but I've had personal experience of this because obviously my mother died when I was 21 and the, the response or the way you react to that kind of tragedy is to say, oh, well, the way, there's a chance that I can see her again. She's not completely gone. She's in Jehovah's memory and I can see her again if I cling as closely as possible to Jehovah's one true organisation and if, if I expend myself as fully as possible so that I'm not on the fringe of the organisation, I'm right there in the centre, then I'm in with a shot of actually having her back in my life at some future point. That's the thought process you have, that's the thought process that's being described here. So that this uh, this woman ends up becoming a pioneer because that's her way of seeing her father again. And I just think that there is something deeply, deeply grotesque about, about someone's death being used in that way. So that in a way, the pain is exacerbated because in addition to losing your father or whoever has died, the death is being exploited by a cult that is using that, using that tragedy to say, don't worry, we're on top of this, we have all the answers, we can fix this problem for you if you will only use your life in our service. It is really exciting to reach many people by traveling on dirt roads that are often muddy. People are generous, hospitable, and genuine. People who, despite being generous, hospitable, and genuine, will be destroyed by God if they don't become Jehovah's Witnesses. We got a letter saying that we have been reassigned to Sierra Leone branch. And it was a huge change for us. Then what we did, we, we googled Sierra Leone, and what we saw, it was only about the civil war that took place years ago. Ebola outbreak was starting in West Africa. Some of our relatives were worried about that. That was our impression, first impression, about the country. We were terrified and we couldn't sleep. We just prayed whole night. Yeah, really, with the reassignment, our greatest fear 
was my, my father. He had been terminally ill about two years. And we knew that at some point it, it will get worse. He would need more help and also use his mother. So are we able to travel back to Finland? It's so expensive and we didn't have a savings. So although we have all those fears, after praying about it a lot, we just realized that we cannot say no. And we realized that this assignment is from Jehovah. Let's go there. Let's get to the work. Let's give our best to it. So from one disturbing testimony straight to another, we now have this charming looking uh, couple from Finland who were serving in the Finland branch. And they are given this assignment to go to Sierra Leone, a country that is in the grips of an Ebola outbreak. Great choice there, Watchtower. And they also have this scenario where his father is terminally ill, has been terminally ill for two years. He really needs his son around. His son needs to be there so that he can at least enjoy what the time that's left with his father. But be, and, and you also will have noticed where the wife says that they had no savings. And that tells you a lot straight away. They would got to this point in their lives where due to serving Watchtower as full-time servants because they'd been serving in the Finland branch, they had no money. That's the situation they were left in by an organisation that is against higher education, against um, furthering your career so that you can be independent financially. This is where it gets you to the point where you don't have money for in case you need to buy a plane ticket to go and be at your dying parents' bedside. But they accept this nightmare assignment, which they confess was keeping them up at night because they were, quote, terrified. They accept this assignment because it's from Jehovah, which takes us back to what I was saying earlier <clears throat> about Jehovah and Watchtower being almost interchangeable in these propaganda videos. If Watchtower gives you an assignment, actually it's Jehovah that's giving you the assignment, so you don't get a choice. It doesn't matter if there's a risk that you won't be able to be there for your dying father, you have to accept it. Then actually in, in three months, our greatest fear, it came true. It really happened that uh, Yusuf's mom she called us and she told that Yusuf's father's uh, situation, it has changed. So we started immediately to check flights. And then the next call was that uh, he had passed away. We were able to get flights, fly back to home and support my mother, help with the funerals. We were so happy when we finally got back to Sierra Leone, and now we thought that we can focus to our assignment and, and our work at Bethel. Then one day we got another Skype call from my father, and then he told that he's diagnosed with uh, extremely aggressive cancer, and he's in hospital now, and he asked us to come back to Finland for visits. We had a beautiful 10 days together with my father, but then finally he passed away. Yeah, that was really the lowest point in our life. That came out of the blue. We were not expecting it. We had two widows to take care of. So we were really thinking if we can continue in our assignment in Sierra Leone. I don't see how this story reflects well on Watchtower at all. If, if I were the writing department at Watchtower, I wouldn't want to talk about this. I wouldn't want to acknowledge that this happened, let alone include this as a segment in a JW Broadcasting episode. This is horrific. You have a couple who are sent out to uh, Sierra Leone with no money to get themselves back if they need to, and with the knowledge that, that um, his father is dying. And by the time the call comes through, it's too late. The damage has already been done. He can only go back and help with the funeral because he wasn't there. He'd, he'd accepted this assignment from Jehovah so that he missed those precious final moments with his father. He'll never get that back. 
and it was Watchtower that took that from him. But of course, he's only filled with gratitude and eagerness to rush back to his assignment or their assignment, only for them to get more news that her father is ill. They rush back and get 10 days. They get 10 days with her father. So at least 10 days, I guess. But even that, why could they not just have been there for their parents? How does this make Watchtower look good? It doesn't. You're, you're thinking, this is not an assignment from Jehovah. This is an, an assignment from a cult that is exploiting this couple so that in addition to being dirt poor, which they have confessed to, they, that they didn't have any savings on leaving uh, fin the Finland branch, they're not even in allowed to be at the side of their parents when their parents need them most. And just to be able to enjoy those final moments with their parents. I, I don't understand how this is a story that puts Watchtower in a remotely good light. At that time, one of our favorite scriptures was Isaiah 30, 15, that your strength will be in keeping calm and showing trust. And when we poured our hearts to Jehovah in prayer, we could so well see how Jehovah helped us to stay calm and have peace. And we got some good advice here from Matthew Brothers not to make any quick decisions. So we put our trust to Jehovah and we could just see that it was Jehovah's will that we continue in our assignment in Sierra Leone. The fact is that really the blessings always surpass any of the challenges. Going through these experiences, uh, we are so happy that Jehovah is a writer of our story. And uh, for sure, there's a happy end. If he wants to take you there, go there. See what Jehovah has in mind for you. And then you can really taste and see that Jehovah is good. Despite heartbreaking challenges, the Halmes saw Jehovah's loving support and they did not give up. And where did that get them exactly? I don't see a positive here. They have convinced themselves that all of these sacrifices that they made, including the sacrifice of not being around for their dying parents, they have concluded that, oh, well, in the end, all of this was wonderful, and we're actually glad that they, they say Jehovah has written our story for us because everything turned out well in the end. I don't see the... I don't see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow here. I don't see a plus side. They're out there in Sierra Leone serving a cult and they didn't get to be around for their dying parents. What is the plus side here? They've convinced themselves that all of this is worthwhile. This is, the sacrifice is worth it. We're having an amazing time. Any follower of any cult can convince themselves that it's worth it. Because when you've been indoctrinated to believe that you're saving mankind, that you're participating in a life-saving, never-to-be-repeated work, every, anything can be worth it then. And it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses that exercise this level of control on people. We need courage. As was announced last year, courage is this year's regional convention theme. The drama presentation will focus on a Bible character that needed great courage to accomplish his ministry. It's our pleasure to present a preview of the drama, The Story of Jonah, A Lesson in Courage and Mercy. Papa says you are a prophet. I was a prophet. I tried to run away from Jehovah. But when has Jehovah ever asked a prophet to go to a foreign land to preach judgment against it? What about the people? They worship gods of war. What do you think they're like? So, what will you do now? You need to go back inside, Joanna. No, we can talk to Father. Joanna, I can't go to Nineveh. I just can't do it. You're Jehovah's prophet. Not anymore. Go home, Joanna. Oh, 
over. Out of the depths of the grave, I cried to you for help. What will become of me? No doubt you eagerly anticipate this year's regional convention program held around the world starting this month. No doubt, indeed. Um, if you follow my channel, if you're one of my subscribers, you'll probably know that I've already done an honest review of the Jonah drama. So check that out if you haven't done so already. It's one of the most recent uploads. Um, I'm actually... <laughs> I'm actually quite relieved with the Jonah drama, especially when you compare it to the drama from the year before, Remember the Wife of Lot, where you have this deeply manipulative uh, imagery of a woman turning to salt, at least in her mind, because she's not living her life exactly the way Watchtower wants her to live it. And you also, you know, throw in the homophobia and all of the other areas of manipulation and misogyny. I think by contrast, this year's drama is something of a relief because it's not as manipulative. It's obviously intended to manipulate witnesses and there is an element of manipulation in it, as you would expect. But for the most part, I can imagine witnesses watching this Jonah drama and just being astonished at how little this story makes sense how silly the story is, and above all, how gullible the people of Nineveh are. Because you're watching the Nineveh scene where Jonah rides into Nineveh, or turns up in Nineveh, and starts proclaiming judgment. And when people are sceptical, you're kind of thinking, well, that makes sense to be sceptical. If someone were to turn up in your local town and start saying, Jehovah will overthrow this town, in 40 days, you would need to take it with a pinch of salt. You would be well within your rights to think, this guy, <laughs> this guy needs certifying. But to actually see the opposite situation eventually where the Ninevites take it to an extreme and say, oh, not only do we believe you, not only do we believe that Jehovah's going to destroy Nineveh, but we're going to wear sackcloth, which by the way doesn't look like sackcloth, it looks more like grey felt to me. We're going to put on grey felt and we're going to put grey felt on our animals as well. And maybe when Jehovah sees that we're making our animals wear grey felt, he'll change his mind because you need to wear grey felt if, if, you're going to be, <laughs> if you're going to be deemed repentant. The story doesn't make sense and it's not relatable at all. And um, apart from the fact that the acting is terrible, I can imagine people falling asleep during this drama. I think that those that manage to stay awake will be slightly scratching their heads thinking, I can't take this story seriously. I know I'm supposed to, but this, I can't relate to what's happening here. I started pioneering less than a year after I got baptized. So I was eager to sharpen my preaching skills I really wanted to share my hope with others. But it's so hard to meet people at their homes during the day. And even if we do meet them, it's not easy to start a conversation. Our congregation organized convenience store witnessing from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. So I thought this might be a good way to reach people and have meaningful conversations. The sample presentations from our meetings were also very helpful. In the past, I hardly got the chance to open the Bible while I was preaching, but now I have a few Bible studies. Even the time we spend traveling from one convenience store to the next is very uplifting spiritually because we use that time to share our preaching skills and build each other up. Having a regular share in convenience store witnessing has allowed me to be more productive in the ministry. I feel like I'm progressing spiritually and becoming a better minister of the good news. So this apparently is a thing in South Korea where Jehovah's Witnesses will call on convenience store owners first thing in the morning. I can't imagine being that thrilled if I was a small business owner and I had Jehovah's Witnesses walk through my door knowing that they're wanting to um, distract me essentially from doing my work. I can't imagine being that thrilled. 
And actually, I can remember doing work similar to this when I was a witness. I wasn't calling on convenience stores per se, but I can remember calling on businesses and it didn't go down that well. I can actually remember I found one person who would allow me to call literally at his office. So I was on the business premises and I was talking to him and leaving in magazines and that kind of thing. And I can remember it ending in a quite ugly way when when this other lady came, I think it must have been his boss, and said, we don't appreciate you calling here, can you please stop calling? And looking back, it makes total sense, because how how dare I assume that I can stop him from doing his job for a, for a brief while, a time that he's being paid for, so that he can listen to what I have to say. It's quite presumptuous, really, but that's apparently what witnesses in South Korea are expected to do. It's hard to get excited about the preaching work when you're not meeting many people. I wanted to set a good example for my family, but I found it a real challenge to maintain my zeal for the ministry. So I began to regularly participate in evening witnessing on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. I usually get off work around 5 p.m. After a long day at work, it's not always easy to get dressed to go out in the field ministry. But I kept up with my return visits and had some really encouraging experiences. A young man I had been visiting accepted a Bible study, and he's making fine progress. My children were able to see how much joy I get from the ministry. And so now, they too are able to give a bold witness in their own words, even in the face of opposition. I am very proud of my children, training and teaching them how to make effective return visits and Bible studies brings me great joy. Again, there is nothing to be proud of when it comes to child indoctrination. Any cult can do it. It's practically the only way that cults continue and proliferate is because it's easier to manipulate children than it is to manipulate and convince adults. I don't see how this is something that Watchtower can continually celebrate, even in one single episode, this whole idea of, oh, well, if you pioneer, your children will be convinced to pioneer as well, and you'll convince them, you'll manipulate them into following your example. Nothing to be proud of. And there's also this thing about evening witnessing. Again, I can remember doing this as a Jehovah's Witness, and it was the one aspect of preaching that filled me with genuine dread. And I literally only did it because I felt I had to, and it was the only way to uh, get my hours in on some occasions, was to join with um, a small group in my congregation who would do evening witnessing, and it just felt so unnatural to be knocking on someone's door at night time and you kind of glance through the, the front window and see them, see maybe the family settling down and enjoying uh, the television after they've finished their meal or whatever. They're unwinding. It's been a long, perhaps stressful day for, for, for the parents. And there you are knocking on the door. I could just about bring myself to do it. I certainly didn't enjoy it. And if this is Watchtower's idea of shaking things up and increasing the joy that witnesses have in their preaching work, I can't see it working. It's a small rural town, so many people are concerned about what their neighbors would think if they talked with us. So even those who were interested in learning more about the Bible were reluctant to have Bible discussions with us. It was really unfortunate. We tried to figure out the right time to call on people, and we found out that many householders are more relaxed and willing to talk about the Bible if we visit them around 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening. Between 9 and 10 o'clock in the evening, apparently, that was the best time for these ladies to call on people's homes and try to convince them that unless they follow their beliefs, they will be destroyed at Armageddon. Apparently, that's the best time. I, I can't understand how in any culture that would work. 
I can only imagine being more annoyed at someone bothering me at that time. But apparently, so long as it serves Watchtower's interests, anything goes. You might feel that you've worked every corner of your home territory, but just like a literal fisherman adapts to the time when the fish are biting, we need to work when people can be found. Cast your nets into productive waters. I'm going to be completely honest. I was never fully comfortable with the whole analogy of catching fish, even when I was a Jehovah's Witness. You kind of accept it, and obviously it's in the Bible. It's not just witnesses who use this illustration, because obviously Jesus used this illustration, supposedly. But when you think about it, there's something quite unnerving about celebrating the process of catching people as though they're fish. Because what is a net? It's something that restricts people's movement. They, the fish goes from being free to being confined. And I think a cult like Watchtower celebrating that analogy speaks volumes. It was really nice of Maria to invite me in service. But I already have plans with Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Anyone made plans to work together? Okay, Joanna, you can work with Sara. Anyone made plans to work together? Could I work with Alicia? Uh huh. Joanna, could you two work together, please? Oh, I'd love to, but I've just arranged to work with Sarah. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. No problem. We've already had, in the JW Broadcasting episode, Mark Sanderson telling witnesses that they need to shake things up if they're in a rut. The key to working smarter could be as simple as switching things up a bit. For example, could we work with different publishers instead of the same one all the time. That message came across loud and clear. I don't see how witnesses need to then have a dramatization where this whole thing is acted out so that you have a fictional um, Jehovah's Witness pioneer sister who finds that by starting to work with other ones in the congregation, everything is suddenly so much better. I don't understand why this is necessary. Have you been inspired to make a change in your ministry? Whether big or small, at home or abroad, we can find the satisfaction that comes from reinvigorating our ministry. That's the theme featured in the music video entitled, I'm Making a Change. Serving Jehovah falls into the same routine. The things that I'm doing now, I've always done. So it's clear that I need to break out out of my comfort zone. Now I'm making a change starting from today. I'm turning a page, yes, I'm on my way. Jehovah, I see. So yes, what a delightful music video. Um, Budget Buble there singing about the need to address monotony in your life as a witness by making a change, essentially repeating the message from earlier in the broadcasting episode where witnesses are told that it's their fault if they get bored. If they are in a rut, if they are feeling like they're repeating things, like they're not getting anywhere, like they're just getting stuck in the same routine, they need to shake things up. They need to do more for Watchtower. They need to do things differently. The blame is on them for the fact that they're not getting anywhere. When in truth, the blame is on Watchtower for being an awful cult <laughs> that teaches things that don't make sense. To conclude, we bring you greetings from Bosnia 
and Herzegovina. This mountainous region has a rich history as a traditional meeting place between Eastern and Western cultures dating from the Middle Ages. Because of the diverse religious beliefs within the country, the 1,160 publishers must adapt their preaching methods to appeal to the hearts of those who listen. This is the city of Mostar, which sits on the Neretva River. The Neretva River flows for nearly 230 kilometers, or almost 143 miles. Mostar was a former front line during the wars of the 1990s, and many buildings still bear the marks of the intense fighting that took place. Likewise, the aftermath left many people in this region with emotional and mental scars. Our brothers and sisters are working hard to bring the hope of something good to those in need. So this was the last clip that I wanted to show you from the JW Broadcasting episode. And it's quite an emotional one for me and Diana because the couple that you see walking up the steps at the beginning, believe it or not, that uh, lady is or was our maid of honour at our wedding. So we know this couple, we've spent time with them, we've had them to stay with us, we've been to stay with them, They're, they were essentially friends of our family. That is right up until we left the organisation and they started shunning us. So quite a poignant ending. In fact, it was weird when we saw Bosnia and Herzegovina come up, I sort of said to Diana, I bet they're going to show, and then I said their names, and sure enough, they were the, literally the first people who popped up on the screen. And um, if they're watching, I'm not going to say their names, but if they're watching, I just want them to know that we still have very fond memories of our friendship and we don't hold anything against them. And we hope that one day they realise that they're, they're being exploited. It really is not worth spending their entire lives supporting an organisation that is abusive and that bottom line is untrue. The teachings don't make sense. They are not supported logically with evidence. They fall apart when submitted to the slightest scrutiny. And we would really encourage that the this couple, if you're watching again, I'm not going to say your names, I would encourage you to just give yourself permission to do the research. And who knows, you may you may find out through doing the research that you're fully vindicated because if it is the truth, then it should stand up to scrutiny and you will find having done the objective research, including in what critics have to say, you will find your faith strengthened because, hey, it's true. But if it isn't true, then you get to find that out. You get to be honest with yourself. And yeah, I would really encourage that you embark on that process. But that's pretty much all I have to say in my rebuttal to the May 2018 JW Broadcasting episode. I find it fascinating that witnesses who are stuck in a rut, who are experiencing boredom as a result of being a Jehovah's Witness, are essentially being told that it's their fault. That they don't get to complain about being bored because if they're bored it means that they are not either A, shaking things up a bit by trying different presentations or by working with different ones in the congregation, or B, it means that they're not serving Watchtower more. They could be pioneering, they could be attending the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. They need to be doing more for Watchtower to avoid being bored. That's the message that comes across loud and clear. And I do feel sorry for witnesses who um, who buy into that, who start kind of blaming themselves for feeling bored when the real reason why they feel bored is because they're in a cult and because their teachings don't make any sense. So those were my thoughts about the May 2018 JW Broadcasting episode. I do hope you have found this video interesting. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.